Not now, Colton. Mommy's recording. Hi. Hello, and welcome back to the floor of my living room. Hello, wonderful people, and welcome back to my channel. Lovely to see you again. You know I love when you visit. So glad 2022 is behind us. I feel like I'm now entering my, um, my experimentation year. How about you? You can't see Colton, but he's right here. In the year that gave us a ton of sequels, a bunch of book adaptations, several biopics, yet another Batman movie, excellent, but still, Stepford Wives The Remix, whatever the hell this was, and not one, not two, but three Pinocchio films. A corporate cash grab, a masterpiece, and an absolute joke. A joke that was phoned in at that. Pauly Shore as Pinocchio? Really? Really? Doomed from the start, you guys. After all that, it felt really great to sit down and watch something that felt wholly inspired and original. 98% original. Also, shout out to Nope, because that was also excellent. That's another one you should definitely check out if you haven't. I laughed at the absurdity of it all. I cried at one of the more heartfelt moments. I marveled at the triumph of costume design. Scene after scene, look after fabulous look. There were just so many. Costume designer Shirley Carrada said there were close to 40. And honestly, I feel like there might have been even more. So let's go ahead and break down some of them. Warning, spoilers ahead. So, if you did not do your homework and watch the film, I highly recommend you do. Otherwise, I'm gonna spoil some chunks of it. Maybe not the whole thing, but I'm gonna spoil some pretty decent chunks. You have been warned. Everything Everywhere All At Once is an A24 film written and directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner, AKA The Daniels and produced by Jonathan Wang. It stars the incomparable Michelle Yeoh as our hero, Evelyn Wang, a Chinese immigrant who, alongside her husband, Waymond, played by Ki Huey Kwan, we'll get to him later, I promise, is struggling to maintain her family's laundromat and a fraught relationship with her daughter, Joy, played by standout Stephanie Hsu. Out of nowhere, her husband, Waymond's body is inhabited by the consciousness of a Waymond from another universe, the Alphaverse. To seek Evelyn's aid, give her a warning and cryptic instructions, we love that, trigger a reckoning with what ifs and the life choices that got her to where she was, I really felt that, and ultimately triggered her hero's journey through the multiverse and the quest to save the multiverse from the villainous Jobu Tupaki, her daughter Joy gone mad in another universe, and save Jobu Tupaki from herself. This movie is as beautiful as it is super freaking weird, but I guess what do you expect from the dudes that brought you the turn down for what video? Yeah, they did that. Funny story, by the way, the lead actress from that music video, Sunita Mani, makes a cameo appearance in this film too. So I thought that was a, a cute little Easter egg there. Honestly, I would have loved it a whole lot more if they had just completely edited out the super cringy hot dog hands world. <laughs> like I, it went from weird to gross, like really fast. I, imagine ketchup and mustard, but like. Like, does it just come out of your wrists or? Does it come out of anywhere else? Only, only the wrists. Yeah, I'm gonna make myself sick if I think about it any longer, so let's just move on. I am sad to be a member of the I Can't Unsee It Club. I hate it here. But the costumes, the costumes in this movie, so spectacular. Stephanie Hsu for the win, oh! my god what a performance give her all of the awards this performance was phenomenal some of you might recognize stephanie from the marvelous mrs Maisel, where she played a very sassy may i was actually a background actor on the marvelous mrs Maisel, and we were both on the show at the time at one point 
And I'm really sad that I never actually got to do any scenes with her because I would have loved just the opportunity to to watch her work. I feel like she was such a treat on screen. I can only imagine what it was like behind the scenes with her. I'm both surprised and not at how incredibly stylish Jobu Topaki is. Like on the one hand, she's incredibly depressed and she's gone full nihilist, right? So nothing matters. Okay, nothing matters in this or any universe, which is why she took everything. She took everything from every world and she put it on a bagel. Yes, that's what I said. You heard that correctly. As Joe Butupaki herself says, all my hopes and dreams, my old report cards, every breed of dog, every last personal ad on Craigslist, sesame, poppy seed, salt, and it collapsed in on itself. Because you see, when you really put everything on a bagel, it becomes this, the truth. Nothing else matters. Intense, huh? So we understand that verse jumping and every world in the multiverse is meaningless. But if nothing matters, why not just wear the same thing all the time in every universe? Why bother? Why not just wear like a little black dress or jeans or a potato sack if nothing else matters? Why put all that thought into your wardrobe? On the other hand, if you had the freedom to wear whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, because you didn't care about trends or tradition or social norms, what would you wear? Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. Imagine it, the societal pressure to, to conform, to fit in, is gone, out the window, goodbye. You can wear anything. So what is it? Tell me, what do you wear if you can wear anything? In this way, Jobu Tupaki lets her imagination run wild and uses clothing to show us her mood, her dark sense of humor, not to mention that the costumes also serve as visual cues for every time we do verse jump. And they also serve to demonstrate just how jarringly different Joy and Jobu really are. Costume designer Shirley Karata is a freaking genius, okay? She's also a wardrobe stylist and her portfolio is pure eye candy. Hi, please style me anytime. According to fashionista.com, she has worked with Billie Eilish and Sky Fiera, Selena Gomez, as well as brands like Kenzo and Rodarte, Prada, Miu Miu. She's also worked with Lena Dunham a lot, um, but even a miracle worker like Shirley can't save that mess, in my opinion. She also recently styled the Linda Lindas and Tierra Wack for their music videos. She does it all. She was also the costume designer on HBO Max's Generation, and she is the new queen of my heart. Karata studied art at Cal State U Long Branch before moving to Paris, where she spent three years uh, studying fashion design. Love that for her. And in 2015, she opened a store in East Hollywood called Virgil Normal with her husband, artist and designer, Charlie Stoughton. She already knew Everything Everywhere producer, Jonathan Wang, and she pretty much immediately hit it off with the Daniels and would end up being the perfect person to take on this job. There were very few looks that were actually written into the script, like the aforementioned Elvis jumpsuit. For everything else, they pretty much gave her carte blanche and were like, go nuts, do your thing, have at it. And we are grateful. For the Elvis costume, for example, she just had to go out and buy like a high quality Elvis impersonator costume and then tailor it to fit you. And then everything else she had free reign for, and boy, did she have fun with it. Each look is very much an overall look, by the way, and each look is so specific that I, it's really important to acknowledge all of the brilliant work that was done by makeup artist Michelle Chung and hairstylist Anissa Salazar too. So much work went into the head to toe styling of each look and you can see a lot of thought and planning went into each one by the entire team. The first time we see Jobu Tupaki, she is serving Asian grandma homes in this 
amazing head to toe tartan look complete with visor and face mask and even gray hair. So we initially think she is a grandma. Now I very much originally got Vivian Westwood vibes from this look and I was pleasantly surprised to discover that this was actually designed by Claudia Lee. She's a Chinese New Zealander and a New York based designer who Karada had also enlisted for Goddess Jobu's pleated skirt, which we'll get to a little bit later. What makes this even more fun is that the plaid is actually a callback to the flannel that Joy was wearing in an earlier scene. For Jobu's big reveal to the audience, Karada uh, paid homage to practical Asian matriarchs through their favored protective and face obscuring visors and masks. For a brief second, Jobu's an Asian grandma wearing a gray wig and visor explains, for a brief second, Jobu's an Asian grandma wearing a gray wig and visor explains. Karada, that was Colton running to stare at the birds in the balcony. You associate grunge fashion with plaids and that just feels right for joy. Next, we see the jumpsuit followed by, in quick succession, a wrestler outfit, a tango dancer, and a golfer. Now, something talked about in a The Hollywood Reporter article that I will be referencing throughout this is that Karada wanted to, quote, subvert and reclaim Asian-centric tropes. So she toyed with the stereotype of the perfect Asian who's good at sports uh, through the wholesome pink argyle vest and socks look. I think it's super cute and classic. And actually, aside from the the makeup echoing the argyle, it's I find it pretty understated for Jobu. But we understand that it's a deliberate choice to lean into a specific trope instead of going more for Jobu's typical high fashion look. If she had, we probably would have seen something a little more on par with what I believe is the most iconic golfing of all time, uh, Villanelles from Killing Eve. I have a Villanelle script in the works, by the way. I don't know how many Muppets had to die, but it was worth it. Interestingly, Jobu herself isn't above Muppet side, as we get to see her in whatever this amazing thing is. This is um, Amoeba Jobu, is what, what she is called on set. And uh, in an interview with Character Media, Stephanie Shu joked that since there was this um, panini, I think YouTube is, is still uh, censoring the other word, that this was also, uh, you know, that Jobu. Uh, she says, uh, it's a spike protein alien club look. Um, I'm also vaguely reminded of the TikTok dress. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the House of Sunny uh, Hockney dress that was everywhere and then nowhere. <laughs> I think what was so unfortunate about that particular micro trend is that House of Sunny itself is a sustainable brand. It's an indie sustainable brand. Now, the original dress did sell out twice, so that's great for them but the initial popularity of the dress actually led to a bunch of dupes being made. And so people were really quick to just like buy the cheap knockoffs uh, instead of waiting for a restock and paying for the original because sometimes people favor popularity over ethics. The things we do for trends, right? I'm not sure there are quite as many people that would be brave enough to rock this um, Corona Club Kid look. It is a lot. Still iconic. K-pop star Jobu. In an interview with the New York Times, Daniel Kwan said of Karada, she's able to take the dumbest looking things and turn them into high fashion. In a lot of ways, she's a kindred spirit to our process and very much focused on the same endeavor, putting highest and lowest on the same level and showing people Maybe they're two sides of the same coin. What's funny about this is that we all know that some of the dumbest, most ridiculous looking things <laughs> are high fashion. And the look that immediately comes to mind is Jobu's K-pop star look, which features a Jeremy Scott Adidas jacket with freaking teddy bears on it. Uh, there were a lot of fortuitous coincidences in this design process, and one of them 
was that Karada just happened to have this jacket on hand, just just like lying around. And it ended up being just the absolutely perfect, ridiculous piece. Yeah, I just have things in my kit. Her kit, by the way, is her archive. And I happen to have that Jeremy Scott jacket. I mentioned to them, I have this jacket, which I think could be kind of cool. And they love the fact that from the side, you can see the teddy bear heads. They were like, oh yeah, that would be great. Let's form an outfit based around that. I love the headset. I love the hair, the hair. You guys, her bangs spell Jobu. Anissa Salazar did that. Karata credits K-pop music itself as having been a source of inspiration, as well as uh, Shoichi Aoki's Harajuku street style photos for Fruits magazine, and the work of Moroccan French designer Jean-Charles de Castlebia. I hope I'm saying that right. Now I need to just want to look it up because things I should have done before filming, double checked the pronunciations of things. Jean-Charles de Castlebia. I had to practice that. Jean-Charles de Castlebia, who, if anyone remembers that Lady Gaga outfit uh, also happened to kill some Muppets back in the day. I never intended for this to be a through line, by the way. It's just how it developed, or it's just how this evolved uh, as I went. Look eight, goth Jobu. So for this look, Karata was going for goth anime meets gothic Lolita walking around Harajuku. Love the Usagi hair, love, love the Usagi hair. It's one of those things that's like so, iconic you know especially when you when you grew up watching sailor moon that you recognize it immediately i noticed even like the bangs perfect it feels like a little easter egg for the geeks in the know you know anisa salazar said actually said in an interview um karata had mentioned jobu's necklace and spikes and goth boots and instantly i was like oh we've got to do goth sailor moon hair that would only fit the picture correctly so she shaped the hair piece to have the Sailor Moon bangs, hello. Oh, I noticed. Then added the space buns, complete with faked barbed wire wrapped around them, and a glitter root. The glitter she used also came from her time in Tokyo to fit the Sailor Moon theme. Uh, it's shaped like crescent moons and stars. I... Of the look, Karata said, there was one scene where Evelyn dies and then the credits roll. I'll circle back to this. They just said they wanted something because it's a heavy scene, like maybe something a bit more goth. Yes, and I totally see it, but I also see, hear me out, Baby Metal recently went down to two members and I feel like it doesn't have to stay that way. I feel like we have a strong contender here for making Baby Metal uh, a trio once again. For this look, again, the knee socks, the studded belt, gorgeous Comme de Garçon top, these were again pieces that Karada already had laying around. I would love to to just like rifle through her archive. I, I would be living and dying at the same time, I'll bet. So she's very much flexing her stylist muscles here as well as her design muscles. This is my, uh, my anime inspired uh, goth jobu look today. I'm telling you, you guys, I'm in my experimentation era. I'm excited to see what else I'm going to pull out for... <laughs> for future YouTube videos. <laughs> I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna have fun with it. Look nine, goddess Jobu. So I wanted to say that this is my favorite, but I have several favorites. I feel like my favorite will, will change on the day that you ask me. This is probably my favorite team collab look between Karada, Chung, and Salazar. The hair especially is a big draw, right? Bagel, but make it fashion. I actually wanted to get a, a bagel <laughs> for this bit. And if I still lived in Brooklyn, I would have. But I live in Maryland now, and um, I've already given your pizza a chance. Fool me once. I've, I've never seen a more exquisite looking bagel. Have you? A bagel with a cult following, I might add. And this is a motif that we see repeated throughout the film as well. Now, if you saw my video on Gwendolyn Christie personifying the Hitchcock blonde, and if you haven't, yet I will link that up here for you because you should do that. Don't click off this video yet. I need the retention, but watch it after for sure. Um, but if you have already seen that video, then you already know that Hitchcock himself was 
kind of a dick. Well, that a-hole popularized a term that was actually originally coined by his screenwriting partner, Angus McPhail, and that term is MacGuffin. A MacGuffin is an object that exists purely for the purpose of giving your characters something to chase after. Now, in Hitchcock's version of the MacGuffin, the MacGuffin itself, while being super important to the characters, is completely irrelevant to the audience. To us, the people watching the MacGuffin is totally worthless. Do I care about the Maltese Falcon? No. Now, many years later, George Lucas would actually argue that no, actually, your audience should care about the MacGuffin. The audience should care about your MacGuffin just as much as your characters. And so then we get things like R2-D2 being the MacGuffin in the original Star Wars. Anyway, everything MacGuffin bagel. But again, this bagel collapsed in on itself, so it's basically also a black hole. We want to avoid the everything bagel because it's basically oblivion. So the goddess Jobu costume features a pleather jumpsuit. We have a skirt, again designed by Claudia Lee. A cape, we have an oversized pearl collar necklace with attached strings of draped jewels. It was almost like a harness top because it had like a belt section as well. She's got this huge Elizabethan ruff over, over that and these just sickening sleeve length gloves with almost wings. They look like um, an exaggerated sleeve pattern almost. Like it was just a sleeve pattern and they didn't attach the arms to the to the shoulder. I love the pearls around the eyes and the hair. Everything is all tied together beautifully. Do you like my uh, pearl bagels? Uh, my, my goddess Jobu tribute. I'm full of Easter eggs today, you guys. Now, look 10. This is Jumble Jobu or Chaos Jobu. I love this look. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> this was definitely the most Comme de Garçon inspired look of them all. And Karada mentions that this is basically her, her tribute to Comme de Garçon, this look. She hand draped this look herself and with pieces from other costumes. So this was her Comme de Garçon tribute slash this amalgamation of all of Jobu's previous costumes with a little bit of joy thrown in there as well. This is the grand finale look and it is gorgeous. She very thoughtfully patchworked all these remnants of previous outfits together. And again, along with the hair, the makeup, ugh, genius look here. It tells a really moving story in one look. I think I wanted to cry when I saw this look the, the more the moment she transformed into this because i just i felt it it was very moving to me i think i was moved both because of my appreciation for the design of the look and how it all came together and how beautiful it was and all the all the genius choices that came together to make this look and for my immediate empathy for joy if you've ever felt like your life was a completely hopeless mess, I mean, who hasn't? Uh, you totally understood what Jobu slash Joy was thinking and feeling in these moments. You totally got that through the outfit. It embodied the confusion and helplessness that you get just being in this world with so much information and chaos going on. The yellow and red plaid speak to the Jobu Joy crossover, while the worn-in Converse Chuck Taylor sneakers are actually Joy's. Now, if you love details as much as I do, and I'll bet you do, you will especially love this. So in a separate New York Times article, Stephanie Shu mentions that throughout her Jobu costumes, there are little bits of Joy sprinkled throughout coming through here and there, if you look closely enough. For example, if you look at Elvis, she has this sort of rhinestone studded eye look, but one of the rhinestones is shaped like a teardrop. That's joy. It's the hearts, that's joy. It's the heart cut out on the luchador's silver glove um, that reappears on jumbled Jobu's hand at the end. I remember putting that glove on and being like, I love that this fist is actually still symbolizing love and that we're having this fist fight 
it was just such a helpful reminder for me. Yeah, because that's that's fighting with your family. That's 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 arguing with your family. You're mad, but there's still love there, hopefully. And because we got to see Jobu at her lowest low, we got to see her like being sucked into the oblivion of her own everything bagel. It made the ending all the more gratifying, which was the family coming together despite life's many obstacles. Because of love and understanding and actually using your words to effectively communicate your feelings. Hello, Hello. Hello. is this thing, is this on? thing on? It wasn't until I was doing the research for this video that I came to realize the larger significance of the Everything Bagel. In order to demonstrate this significance, we need to showcase the bagel alongside another readily featured typically silly, mundane, everyday object. The googly eye. The googly eye is the physical and metaphorical inverse of the everything bagel. Whereas the everything bagel represents Joy, Jobu's more nihilistic view of the universe, the googly eye represents life having meaning after all. It's hope, it's optimism, it's choosing to find the meaning in things. And this way, the googly eye represents a sort of existentialism. Up close, the everything bagel and the googly eye are absurd, but when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, you realize they're physical representations of yin and yang. Y'all, that isn't even all of Jobu's looks. You'll just have to watch the film <laughs> to see the rest of them. I went through 10 looks with you and that isn't even all of them. That wasn't even all of the ones that made the movie. For everything that you saw, there were still a bunch of looks that didn't even make the final cut. Editing me here, and I just realized that she's cycling through these objects. The last one is an Oscar, and yes, get it, girl. Evelyn. Admit it, the film's biggest draw is Michelle Yeoh. I think when you're attempting a film this freaking weird, <laughs> You need to feature someone in it that the audience already trusts if you want to give this film a chance. I'm not sure that I could have convinced my boomer in-laws to watch the film if she hadn't been in it. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I don't even think I would have tried to be honest. I think like most people, I just assumed that because she was the lead that the film was amazing. And fortunately, I was correct. <laughs> Though, again, I could have done without hot dog hands. Just, I don't know of anyone else that that could have carried that film the way Michelle Yeoh did. When the Daniels originally planned this movie, they envisioned Jackie Chan as the lead. What the? Okay. Now there will be weird humming in the background. Love that. With Michelle Yeoh's character taking on the the Waymond role. And while I would have loved if Jackie Chan had made an appearance in this film, I'm very glad that the final mother-daughter centered story is what it ended up being. And even the Daniels admit that this version of the film was much better for it, that they were very happy with the change they made with making the the matriarch more centered to the story. Yeah, I'm very glad that the final mother-daughter centered story is what the film ended up being about. It was definitely a very big part of the appeal for me. I am someone that took her mother to the theaters to see Pan's Labyrinth. It was in Spanish so she could actually understand it because sometimes your immigrant parents can't be bothered to learn more than a handful of the words of the local lingo. And bonus, it also featured a mother-daughter relationship at the heart of a movie that was also gorgeous and super freaking weird. Five stars, highly recommended. Guillermo del Toro can do no wrong. By the way, Daniel Kwan himself is the son of immigrants from Taipei and Hong Kong, and that's why the characters in the movie are speaking Cantonese and Mandarin and mixed Chinese English because that's just what he grew up hearing and how he grew up speaking with his own family. It's funny that Michelle and Jackie Chan are actually very good friends <laughs> uh, and they have known each other forever. So at one point he texted her and now she just gets to gloat about having taken this role that he was offered. <laughs> just because he wasn't available. Jackie actually texted me, she said, and he says, wow, I hear amazing things about your movie. Did you know that the boys came to see me in China? And I said, yes, you're lost, my bro. 
<laughs> queen. Of the many serendipitous occurrences in this filmmaking process, arguably one of the greatest has to be that Shirley Carrada's own parents used to own a laundromat. I mean, they seriously could not have picked a more perfect costume designer for this job. So she actually went shopping for many of the normal clothes in LA's Chinatown. It just made sense because that's where the characters themselves would shop. So for example, that whole first look that you see Evelyn in with the quilted vest, that all came from Chinatown. Apparently almost 90% of Evelyn's wardrobe, of Wayman's, and um, the grandpa played by James Hong, that was all acquired in Chinatown. Now, when Evelyn starts verse jumping, we see her training to become a Kung Fu master. And that in turn leads her to become this big name action star. So this universe is very true to Michelle Yeoh's own life and career. And we see her at a premiere in this show-stopping Ellie Saab gown. Again, very true to Michelle Yeoh because he's one of the designers that she loves wearing. And something else that's really fun here is that you'll see flashes of real life red carpet footage of Michelle Yeoh to help sell that movie star universe uh, life. There's, there's even a, like, you can even see her at the Crazy Rich Asians premiere in one second and here we're, we're really trying to paint the picture of movie star Evelyn's life with this real world footage. And I thought that was really fun. Karata also sourced inspiration from Michelle Yeoh's own martial arts films for the Kung Fu costumes. Evelyn's most elaborate look is that of her Chinese opera singer self. And it is absolutely stunning. And everyone involved was determined to get the details as period accurate as possible. We love to hear that. I, my voice is going. I was sick for so long, like I'm just getting over sickness. So sorry if my voice is like raw. <laughs> I think I had the flu, it was really bad. And then on the sickness's way out, Aunt Flo came in and I was like, you are the worst. But I was determined to film this video and get it out for you guys. So I hope you appreciate it. Salazar told Pop Sugar, not only did I spend hours on YouTube researching behind the scenes of how these performers get ready and understanding why they chose certain styles and certain colors, but it was important to me to make sure that I'm representing that community and that look specifically in every little detail. So for example, in her research, Salazar learned that tree sap was traditionally used to set the hair back then, to build the shape of the hair. But as far as historical accuracy goes, we don't need to take it that far. So she ended up just using a hair gel that served as a close modern alternative that still allowed her to build and style the hair and re-wet it and reset it whenever she needed to on the day of. But props for the research. I, I commend the whole team for that. We also see Evelyn as a teppanyaki chef at a bocce grill in a hilarious live action Disney movie universe that should never be made ever, ever, with um, an obscure twist that you just need to see to believe and just a very delightful cameo appearance by Harry Shum. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you, it's Rakakui. <laughs> so it's Ratatouille, but with a raccoon instead of a rat. And just to up the Disney factor here, just to make it that much more ridiculous, the raccoon itself is voiced by Randy Newman. Yeah, that guy we all have a friend in. And if that wasn't enough, Randy Newman actually contributed a song to the soundtrack. <laughs> so this scene with Randy Newman voicing the raccoon has a Randy Newman song in it. So. Go ahead and, and check that out. It's hilarious. I, it's too funny. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. In her final look back in our universe, the IRS universe, back in her home world, we see Evelyn back at the laundromat at the Chinese New Year party that she's hosting. And she is wearing the most amazing cardigan. <laughs> and I tried while I was watching to guess who the designer is. And once again, this was just something Karata picked up in Chinatown. 
<laughs> like, there's probably a few Chinese grandmas or moms right now that just have this in their closet. Um, let me know if you know one or are one and you want to get rid of yours. I want it. That's the one thing that's sometimes fun about when you get stuff from other countries and there's a word on it or multiple words where you're like, what does this mean? The sweater is very like something a mom or grandma would wear, but punk. I thought it was perfect because it also nods to Michelle's character in terms of like, she is kind of punk rock. She realizes it, but you don't get that impression in the beginning. She didn't think that she was, but there's an element of her being punk. I also feel like the fact that she left her country and her parents do not approve and moved to the States to start a business, that takes a lot of balls to do. I think we need to give credit to all the immigrant parents that have done that. It's a difficult thing. There's an element of punk rock to that. And I completely agree with that. Shout out to immigrant parents. You, you're doing the thing. Waymond. Ki Huey Kwan has blessed us with his return to acting after a decades long absence. Oh my God, it's Data from the Goonies. <laughs> it's Short Round from Temple of Doom. Did millennials just like collectively manifest child stars coming back? <laughs> like, great job us. <laughs> it keeps getting better, right? The way Macaulay Culkin resurfaced to deliver a standout performance on American Horror Story and then just like appeared on the Gucci runway and then ki Hu Kwan showed up and asked him to hold his beer so that he could deliver this. Welcome back, sir. I am so here for it. I love the fanny pack kung fu, the fanny pack foo, if you will. That scene, like all of the fight scenes in this film, phenomenal. Clearly his years as a stunt coordinator have served him well. As if this wasn't amazing enough, it has been confirmed that he will be joining the cast of Loki season two. I cannot wait. I look forward to Marvel delivering on my now extremely high expectations. So again, here, the humble fanny pack, an accessory most often teased and associated with tourists. Here is seen getting the full John Wick treatment and much like pencils, I will never think of the fanny pack the same way again. Again, this, like every fight scene in this movie, so wonderful. You know what else is wonderful, by the way? The soundtrack by Sun Lux. So, did I just spit under the, okay, whatever. So be sure to give that a listen. It is absolutely gorgeous, and I hope that it earns its own Oscar nod. Waymond is pretty much a superhero in every universe, though it takes Evelyn a while to finally realize this. At the beginning of the film, you kind of get that she doesn't give her husband very much attention at all. It takes Evelyn forever to finally realize this and to respect and adopt his approach to problem solving, his approach to handling situations for the good of humanity. You see, Wayman's superpower is kindness, which turns out to be the key to saving everyone. At the beginning of the film, we see Evelyn ripping googly eyes off of laundry bags, which I think is a hilarious gag, by the way, and I wanna put googly eyes on everything. At the end of the film, when Evelyn places the googly eye on her forehead, she is showing that she is choosing existentialism. She's choosing hope and kindness and optimism and literally overcoming the absurdity of existence. She is choosing to find meaning in life. The final fight scene is an amazing fight scene because it's not actually a fight scene. This final battle involves Evelyn verse jumping into each combatant's universe to help them solve their problems and make them happier people. This is Wayman's influence on her. This is her finally getting and understanding his hope and optimism and his way of doing things. He's always been the opposite of Joy Jobu in this way. Traditionally, yin represents darkness, chaos, and femininity, while the yang represents positivity, lightness, and masculinity. So Jobu and Wayman are themselves representations of yin and yang. And while the bagel and the googly eyes are circles unto themselves, we know that traditionally yin and yang are very much represented traditionally as two halves of a whole, meaning you can't have one without the other, and you need both for a balanced life. 
And I think it's interesting to look at this from the angle of the family dynamic. When Evelyn finally recognizes Wayman's conflict resolution ability for the superpower that it is, and when she accepts that Joy is a lesbian, and without any shame or embarrassment, finally, properly introduces Joy's girlfriend to Grandpa as her girlfriend and not just a friend, she repairs her relationships with both her daughter and her husband, because she needs both in her life, and thus obtains balance. In adopting this approach, Evelyn is teaching Joy Jobu that your actions and behavior determine your reality. That's existentialism in a nutshell. Obviously, my preferred Waymond is CEO Waymond from the movie star universe. You could actually also refer to this as the Wong Kar Wai universe, since his film served as reference for this uh, Waymond. And there are some obvious nods to In the Mood for Love in these scenes too. But that's not the only reference. So earlier I mentioned a scene where Evelyn dies and the credits roll. At first you think the movie just ends there and actually my, my in-laws did. They were like, what? It ends? That's how it ends? <laughs> no, it doesn't people. I didn't just like spoil the end of the movie. I think we're like halfway through the movie at this point, honestly. So again, at first you think the movie ends there until the camera pulls back and you realize that it's a movie that the audience is watching in the movie star universe. This was a reference to a scene in the Satoshi Khan directed anime, Paprika, which ends with uh, one of the characters going to the theater to watch a movie he's the star of. In the movie star universe, the film they just watched was also directed by the Daniels. In Paprika, when the detective visits the theater, there are posters of previous Satoshi Khan films in the theater. And the film itself was also a Satoshi Khan directed uh, movie. Paprika was also one of the films that the Daniels had actually suggested that Karada watch to get a sense of the vibe that they were going for. Homework she requested, by the way. We love a designer who loves research. Interestingly, for all of the money that this well-off Waymond has, this suit, again, is just something that Karada picked up this time in Koreatown, I believe. He just makes it look like a million dollars. I cannot stress how happy I am for him to be returning to film. I'm, I'm actually super happy for him. And I think that what makes this even more special is what actually sparked his return to acting was watching Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> Imagine watching Michelle Yeoh on screen and getting excited for all of the Asian representation that you're seeing on screen and how that ignites your desire to return to Hollywood. And then you immediately get yourself a new agent and then your first roll back, you're starring opposite Michelle Yeoh. I just, I love that for him. And for us. Finally, I want to talk about the legend, the icon. This film is full of legends. The icon that is Jamie Lee Curtis. IRS Karen. Amelia Bedelia. JK. IRS Inspector <laughs> Deirdre Bo Beardra. They could have gone either way here. So the look for this character was actually based off of a photo of a real life IRS inspector <laughs> that Daniel Kwan found online and like just sent to Jamie Lee Curtis. And she's like, oh my God, yes, this. Um, but Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis saw the photo and she was like, this is amazing. And she desperately wanted to embody this character. And you might be wondering why? But then I thought about it. And um, it's really just another kind of liberating, you know? And another groundbreaking move, you know, score one for radical acceptance or body neutrality or whatever you want to call it. She just let it all hang out. Like that's not a prosthetic, that's her body. No spanks, all stomach. And this was a very deliberate choice. And I need to read to you exactly what she said, because I feel like it will resonate with many of us. She said, uh, in the world, there's an industry, a billion dollar, trillion dollar industry about hiding things, concealers, body shapers, fillers, procedures, clothing, hair, accessories, 
hair products, everything to conceal the reality of who we are. And my instruction to everybody was, I want there to be no concealing of anything. I've been sucking in my stomach since I was 11. When you start being conscious of boys and bodies and the jeans are super tight. I very specifically decided to relinquish and release every muscle I had that I used to clench and hide the reality. That was my goal. I hear my husband coming up the stairs right now. Let's see what he says about my face. <laughs> That was great. I need a second camera in the future. It was great. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm almost done and then I'll get to tacos, I promise. Oh, okay. Can I move? Yeah, go around me. What do you think? What? How do I look? You look like what's her face from everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes, that was the goal. Good. Goal achieved. Excellent. <laughs> hey, Colton. Now I'm petting a cat. Jamie Lee Curtis has always been a real one. In this age of everyone weighing in on the Nepple Baby discourse, um, she too has recently weighed in with her own spectacularly bad take. There have been some truly spectacularly. Ugh, I can't talk anymore. There have been some spectac spectacularly bad, my voice is going everyone, I'm sorry. Spectacularly bad takes that completely missed the point. I love you Coco, this three part Instagram story, the series was um, not it. And even though she herself has weighed in with her own bad take, she uh, herself has never denied her own privilege, which a lot of people don't seem to understand is the heart of the Nepo baby situation. It's not the nepotism itself, props to you for continuing on in your family business. It's the outright uh, denial <laughs> and the lengths that many of these people will go to to flat out deny that their family connections have anything to do with their success. Y'all aren't being persecuted here, give me a break. No one is attacking you for being what you are. You're just getting called out for denying who got you where you are. You know who hasn't done that? Jamie Lee Curtis. And again, sure, she recently weighed in with her own bad take, but she herself has never denied her advantages. And for that, we give her props. In the Hot Dog Hands universe, there's um, actually a callback to Deirdre's knitted vest. Also, everything in this world is purposefully <laughs> Fifty Shades of Hot Dog. It's all pinks and beiges and very deliberately so. And that's all I'll say about it. Get me out of here, please. I hate it there. <laughs> so. Privileged or not, grab your parents, your grandparents, and watch this movie and laugh, cry, heal some generational trauma, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Feel free to like and subscribe while you're at it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to check out a few others while you're here. Check out the links below to all my sources for further reading. Download the Sun Lux soundtrack to this film and give that a listen. And until next time, make it a great one and I'll see you back here for my next video. Bye. Hopefully my, my voice is much better. Normally I end each video with Colton content. I don't have any stock like Colton um, footage ready to go, but I do have an actual um, Colton right here to say hi to all of you. So here we go. Here, are you eating my plantain chips? All right, my husband is hungry and eating all the snacks, so I have to go make dinner now and feed him and feed our boy and not talk for the rest of the day because I have no voice left. All right, you go over there. Okay, bye for real now.